We're going to move on now to our last presentation before we get into the business part of, uh, of the meeting. And so I would like to introduce Peter Ansoff, the president of NAVA, uh, joining us uh, from Virginia. Peter also leads one of NAVA's interest area meetings on American Revolution era flags. Uh, Peter is also member, a member of the Chesapeake uh, Bay Flag Association, and he won the 2002 Driver Award and earned an honorable mention at the 2009 NAVA annual meeting. He is presenting his paper entitled, The Sign Their Banners Bore, The Pine Tree Flag in the American Revolution. Peter, over to you. Hello again. As you probably know, uh, my interest is in sort of discovering the reality behind the legends of uh, Revolutionary War flags. The uh, paper that I won the driver award for back in 02 was about the first Navy Jack, and the reality there was that uh, that it didn't exist <laughs> during the Revolution. Um, that's not the case in what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to talk about a flag that really did exist, and that's the uh, the white flag with a pine tree on it and the motto, uh, Appeal to Heaven. Um, the story of this flag is actually three different stories that are somewhat related, and we'll, we'll take them one by one. The second story is the one we're going to spend the most time on because it's the one that uh, primarily established this flag as, 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 part of the, uh, as part of the pantheon of Revolutionary War flags. Um, and this flag has been part of that pantheon for quite a while. Uh, George Preble had three versions of it in his, in his book. And uh, it turns up all the time. At least one turned up among the flags that were carried in the, uh, the, the January 6th uh, uh, assault on the Capitol. By the way, the, uh, the title of this presentation comes from a poem that was written by Oliver Wendell Holmes at the beginning of the Civil War. Uh, and he was talking about the, um, how, uh, the, 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 the tree as a symbol of, of American his role in American history as a symbol of liberty. And it, this, the poem started out, 80 years have passed and more since under the brave old tree, our fathers gathered in arms and swore they would follow the sign their banners bore and fight till the land was free. So as I said, there are three stories. And to talk about the first story, we have to go back to the summer of 1775 and the city of Boston. Now, Boston in 1775, this, this is downtown Boston as we know it, it was almost entirely uh, an island. It was um, surrounded by water except for, for um, Boston Neck down here, which connected it to Roxbury. And what that meant was that, well, first of all, the, um, the, the British Army was occupying the city and they were all, also occupying the Charlestown Peninsula up here, which they had captured in the battle that we know as Bunker Hill. And the American Army, uh, was sort of manning a uh, defense line all the way along. This is the American line, the Mystic River up here, all the way down and around eventually to, to the lines at Roxbury. And their headquarters is at Cambridge, which is a little little town right, right there. And because of this situation that they were divided by water, uh, both sides improvised um, gunboats, which were essentially row barges with, with cannons on them. And they call those floating batteries. Uh, the Americans built three floating batteries in Cambridge, and this is the only uh, period picture that's known of a floating, an American floating battery. Uh, it was uh, uh, drawn by a, a cartographer for the British for the British Army. His name was Charles Blaskowitz. Now. Uh, you can, you can see it's a, it's a relatively crude sort of thing, but uh, what's interest, of interest to us is that it has a flag. And uh, we can look at the flag more closely, and there it is in the picture I had a minute ago. Um, you can see it has a tree, uh, and it has some sort of random looking characters that don't really seem to mean anything. Uh, Bra Blaskowitz probably didn't know what, it, what the motto there was because he never got close enough to to see one, but we know what it said because uh, of a very famous letter that was written by Washington's secretary, uh, Joseph Reed. Here it is. And he says, um, um, he says, a flag with a white ground, a tree in the middle, and the motto, appeal to heaven. This is the flag of our floating batteries. So that's, uh, that's, that's reasonably solid. We'll talk more about that letter in a minute because that letter is quite, 
significant in uh, the second part of our story. And the, um, the tree was probably a reference to the Liberty Tree, the tree that was on that flag. Uh, and we, we're probably, you're probably familiar with the Liberty Tree um, from American history. It was a tree in Boston that uh, during the Stamp Act crisis became the place where people would gather and, uh, and hang uh, British uh, um, officials in effigy. You can see one hanging there and, um, and uh, generally uh, st stake their claim to, to, to liberty. Uh, and as, the, the, um, as America drifted toward a revolution, it became a symbol of, of American rights. Um, Thomas Paine, who uh, was famous for writing Common Sense, uh, wrote a poem about it, which uh, ended this way. But hear ye, O swains, tis a tale most profane, how all the tyrannical powers, king, commons, and lords, are uniting amain to cut down this guardian of ours. From the east to the west, blow the trumpet to arms. Through the land, let the sound of it flee. Let the far and the near all unite with a cheer in defense of our liberty tree. Well, um, in, at the end of August 19, uh, 1775, um, a loyalist militia unit in Boston uh, made Paine's poem prophetic uh, because they actually did cut down the Liberty Tree. And uh, the local newspaper in Cambridge, which of course was, was uh, not pro-British, <laughs> um, reported it as follows. After a long spell of laughing, grinning, swearing, foaming with malice diabolical, they cut down a tree because it bore the very name of Liberty. But be it known to this infamous band of traitors, the grand American tree of liberty, planted in the center of the United Colonies of North America, now flourishes with unrivaled increasing beauty and bids fair in a short time to afford, under its wide spreading branches, a safe and happy retreat for all the sons of liberty, however numerous and dispersed. Well, the, uh, the, those floating batteries were completed at Cambridge a few weeks after that poem was that, the, that uh, those words were published. So it's not too surprising that they picked a tree uh, to put on the, on the flag of this uh, nation to be. Um, what's interesting is from Blaskowitz's sketch there, you can see that it's clear that the, uh, the tree there was not a pine tree. It was, uh, look, looked like it might be an elm, which is what the Liberty tree was. And that, that kind of makes sense. Now the motto, appeal to heaven, um, as we probably know, was, was an allusion to John Locke's um, second treatise on government. Uh, and it, uh, his point there was that the government exists to protect the right of its citizens. And when the government itself is threatening their rights, the citizens have no choice but to resist by taking up arms and appealing to heaven uh, to recognize the justice uh, of their actions. And the, the uh, leaders of the American Revolution, um, as they saw it, uh, felt that um, this is exactly what was happening in the spring of 1775, that the British government wasn't defending their rights, they were trying to suppress them. So um, they'd all read John Locke, of course, and uh, the phrase appealed to heaven appeared frequently in their, in their uh, writings. So the sources of the floating battery flag are pretty clear. Um, you know, we, we know where they came from. But um, one thing we don't know is, um, who actually came up with the design. There, there's, it just sort of appears in, in the record. There's no, um, no, and we also don't know why, why it was designed. As far as the why, well, one sort of obvious idea is that it's just a, a recognition symbol. If the, both sides had floating batteries, they didn't want to, uh, to be shooting at their own people. So um, that's as much as we know about the first story of the the pine tree flag, which doesn't even really involve a pine tree. Uh, the second story does, however, and that is the story of Washington's cruisers. Now, the, the fact that uh, Boston was an island and was surrounded by the American army uh, meant that all the supplies for the British army in the city and also the civilians who were still there had to come by sea. And it didn't take George Washington, who was the commander in chief of the army, very long uh, to realize that uh, if he had a few armed vessels on patrol in uh, Massachusetts Bay, he could uh, possibly interdict that supply line and uh, make things difficult for the, the British Army and perhaps even capture things that would be useful to his own army. So um, he 
came up with the idea of commissioning uh, a ship uh, using uh, using uh, soldiers from his army uh, to to do that. So to implement his plan, he sought the opinion of this man, John Glover, who was a, um, a regimental commander in his army, had been a merchant from Marblehead in, uh, in uh, civilian life. And uh, Glover uh, suggested that the army charter one of his own ships, a little schooner named the Hannah. So uh, they did that. Washington uh, pr provided some funds from his uh, army budget and um, the uh, and sailors from his army. They commissioned the ship at, at Beverly and went to sea to to raid uh, British ships. They went to sea at the beginning of September 75. The first ship they captured turned out to be an American vessel that had been uh, captured by the British and they were capturing it back, uh, which meant that what Washington directed that it be given back to its original owners. And the crew of the Hannah was very angry because they weren't getting any prize money that way, so they mutinied. And, uh, <laughs> and Washington had to send more troops to Beverly to, to uh, deal with what he called the rascally privateersmen. But um, apparently he decided that the, the experiment was worth trying uh, or worth continuing. So um, he directed that six more ships uh, be commissioned similarly, four up at Beverly, which you see up there, and two down at Plymouth on the south end of the... Uh, uh, of the bay. Now, of course, the, the, none of these ships had anything to do with the Continental Army or the Continental Navy. There was no Continental Navy yet. They were they were under Washington's orders, manned by his his, uh, his soldiers. Now, as the six ships were getting fitted out, there were two other things going on. Um, one was that the British sent a, squ a naval squadron to bombard the town of Falmouth, which is now Portland, Maine. And the second, Congress. Uh, advised Washington that they had information that two British merchant ships were sailing from London to Quebec to, with the supplies for the British Army in Canada. And Washington immediately decided to send two of his ships north to intercept those two transports that were going to, to Quebec. So he, uh, he wrote to Colonel Glover to get, the, get two of your ships to sea as, as fast as you can so we can, we can go intercept those transports. So with all that as background, um, we can take a look at that letter that uh, Joseph Reed wrote that we talked about earlier. And uh, he wrote a letter to, to Glover, who was in, um, in Beverly fitting out the ships. Reed was in, at the headquarters in Cambridge. And he says, we've had a, a council of British squadron that's bombarding Falmouth. Uh, we have to be careful how our vessels fall in with them. In other words, we don't want, we don't want our little schooners getting tangled up with, with British warships. So he says, please fix on a particular color for a flag, a signal or a signal by which uh, our vessels may know one another. What do you think of a flag on a white ground, a, a tree in the middle, the motto appeal to heaven, this is the flag of our floating batteries. So it was a suggestion, hey, we've already got this flag, maybe you could use it as your, as your symbol. And then he says, uh, we're also fitting out two vessels at Plymouth. When I hear from you on this subject, um, I'll, I'll let the people in Plymouth know. So he's saying, figure out what you want to do. I'll, I'll, I'll let everybody know, and, and we'll, ha we'll have our signal. Well, Glover wrote back to him and said, the schooners sailed this morning. In other words, those two schooners are already gone. It's, it's too late to do anything about a flag. Um, they had none but their old colors. Presumably, he meant their British red ensigns that they would have had as, as merchant ships. Um, so we appointed them a signal that they may know each other and be known by their friends, the ensign up to the main topping lift. Uh, that's a quick uh, sort of reconstruction of what that would look like. Uh, this is the main topping lift right here, that line, and that's, that's a red ensign sort of stuck onto it. And then uh, Reed um, wrote back to Glover and, and says that um, the captain of one of the Plymouth ships is, headed, is taking his troops down there and he's given them the signals. And he's also going to tell the other two captains, Captain Manley and Captain Adams, the other two in Beverly, what the signal is going to be. The bottom line of all this is that uh, Reed, was, Reed made a suggestion about the flag, and the suggestion for the most part wasn't taken. Um, and and uh, Reed basically left it up to the crews as to what they wanted to do about, about recognition. In some books, you'll read that you will read that Reed uh, uh, ordered them to use the the flag with the tree, or even that he designed it. But that's there's, there's nothing 
no evidence of that. I may have to run over a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm going to use executive privilege here because <laughs> this, uh, <laughs> this story is, is, I think, rather rather interesting. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> Um, okay, that's, that's a quick rack up of, of Washington's cruisers in 1775. Um, and I put a column on the right saying, did that, is it likely that that ship flew, the, flew a pine tree flag with a, with a motto? Uh, the Hannah uh, didn't. She was, she was a return to her owner before that letter was ever written by, by Reed. Um, the Franklin and the Hancock were the two ships that went to, to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. They didn't because they'd already, they'd already left and they had none but their old colors. Um, the other two might have, we don't really know one way or the other, but we know that the two from Plymouth definitely did. Um, it's a little unclear why um, the, the Plymouth ships would have sort of taken the initiative to, to do that, um, but a, a, a likely possibility is that uh, it was because of their, the captain of the Washington, his name was Cyan Martindale, and he was, he had, he, um, he um, had delusions of grandeur, I would say. Uh, he, he wanted to be captain of a warship, and he was always badgering headquarters, I need more men, I need more guns, and all these things. And uh, he even asked for a fife and drum at one point, so he could, he could uh, be a proper warship. So it would have been very likely for him to uh, want a flag, too. And he'd visited the Army headquarters at Cambridge uh, in early October, so he had probably seen the floating battery flag, and maybe that gave him the idea. Um, this is the birth certificate of the, of, the, uh, of the Washington, which, by the way, was the only one that wasn't a schooner. She was a brig. Uh, it's a, um, an invoice uh, for payment to, to uh, Lucy Hammett of, of Plymouth, for uh, to making a flag and, and to qualifying bunting for the brig Washington. Uh, there's a similar uh, one for the, for the other Plymouth ship, the Harrison, at the same time. So the Washington's flag um, turned out to have an interesting history, although not the way that Captain Martindale intended. Um, she um, went to sea on the 23rd of November, 1775, and on the 4th of December, uh, she sighted a sail, which turned out to be His Majesty's frigate, Foey, 40 guns, and, and Martindale decided that he was completely outgunned, so he surrendered without firing a shot. Um, the Foey brought the captured Washington into Boston, and this raised some interest because this is the first time they'd ever captured an American armed ship. And uh, Martindale was interviewed by the British Commander-in-Chief of the North America Squadron, whose name was uh, Samuel Graves, Admiral Samuel Graves. And uh, Martindale told Graves all about the Harrison. He said, her colors are green pine tree or the white field uh, with a motto appeal to heaven. This, that the, uh, that's an image of, of um, the Admiral's report about this. Uh, he told Graves about the secret recognition signal that he'd worked out with the Harrison's captain and all kinds of other in intelligence like that. Uh, Graves wrote a report that, as I said, that's an extract of his report. Uh, he sent it to the Admiralty in London um, along with the Washington's flag aboard another frigate, the Tartar. The Tartar left Boston on the 15th of December, arrived in England at the beginning of January. Her captain immediately took the stage to London and uh, reported to the Admiralty. Um, the uh, First Lord of the Admiralty, Lord Sandwich, was not there. He was on Christmas vacation at his estate. So uh, Meadows gave the flag to Rear Admiral Palliser, who was the next senior so officer and Palazzo wrote to his boss, uh, Lord Sandwich, and says, Captain Meadows brought in the American vessel's colors, white field, the green pine tree in the middle, the motto appeal to heaven. And he said that Admiral Graves expressed a wish that it might be sent to Admiral Montague as it was taken by his son. Admiral Montague was Admiral Graves' predecessor on the North American squadron, and his son, George Montague, was the captain of the Foey, the ship that captured the flag. The news about the Washington's flag turned up uh, in the London newspapers. And this is the London Chronicle, seeing the flag taken from a provincial privateer is deposited in the Admiralty. The field is white bunting with a spreading pine tree, the motto appeal to heaven. Uh, several of other the London papers uh, picked up the story and had slightly different uh, versions of it. Um, the Gentleman's Magazine, for example, said the motto on her colors was we appeal to heaven, slight, uh, slight difference. Finally, on the 10th of January, uh, Lord Sandwich, who was back from his vacation, 
um, sent the flag to His Majesty the King with a note saying, imagining your majesty might choose to see the rebel flag it is sent here with, I propose, if your majesty permits, to send it to Admiral Montague. And uh, there the second story ends, unfortunately. We don't know what happened after that. And uh, there are two big questions. One is, what did the flag really look like? We, we, we had, okay, a pine tree and a motto, but was, was, the, was the motto on a scroll, as they often are on flags? Was it above or below the pine tree? Whatever. We don't know that. But the really tantalizing question is, what happened to the flag? Um, did, did the king give it to Admiral Montague? Did Admiral Montague give it to his successors? Um, George Montague, the man who captured it, uh, had a, had a, a sterling um, Navy career. He, he made admiral. He served under uh, Nelson at the Battle of the Nile. Wouldn't it be interesting if somewhere in a manor house in England, <laughs> buried in a, in a box in an attic, was the Washington's flag? From all the way from Lucy Hammett to the King of England. The um, Washington continued his cruiser campaign the next year. Um, they built another, they chartered another ship, the Lynch, to re replace the Washington. Um, there were a couple of references to, to pine tree flags um, uh, in this. Uh, in this time, in this, this uh, interval. Uh, the most interesting was by, an, by uh, Captain Samuel Tucker, who was the captain of the, of the Franklin and later uh, shifted to the Hancock. Um, and he, he wrote in, a, in a, um, a letter, the first cruise I made was in January 1776. My wife made the banner I fought under, the field of which was white and the union was green, therein made in the field of a pine tree. Well, that's a little hard to see. If the, if the union was green, what color was the pine tree in the union? Um, so maybe we're talking about something like this. I, I don't know. Um, a few um, paragraphs later, he talked about a battle that he fought uh, while he was in command of the Hancock. And he said, I received no damage and loss of men, but lost a complete set of new sails by the passing of their cannonballs. Then the white field and the pine tree union were riddled to atoms. I was then immediately supplied with a new suit of sails and a new suit of colors made of canvas and bunting of my own prize goods. Um, there's also a curious um, vexillological uh, reference involving the Warren. Um, in uh, July 1776, the, the Warren had tried to capture a British transport but failed uh, because of an explosion aboard the Warren and also the, because of the resistance of the British crew. And the, the captain of the Unity, the ship they were trying to capture, said, she fired a shot to bring us to. She had hoisted no colors, notwithstanding that she had fired a shot. We were surprised at this and could hardly think that she was one of the armed schooners, as the officer would certainly know his duty better. Uh, so the, maybe the British captain was right that uh, Captain Waters didn't know his duty, or maybe he didn't do it because he didn't have a flag to, to, uh, to fly. Uh, there was also, uh, in the outfitting records of the Lynch, they, they referred to four shillings for an ensign staff, but nothing about an ensign. So that's the second story. Third story I'll go through very quickly because it only takes a couple of slides. The uh, Massachusetts State Navy. Um, Massachusetts, like many other, all, like all but two of the, of the 13 states, uh, had its own navy. This, this was a formal military organization with officers and ranks and stuff, and they adopted a flag as, as their, as their uh, ensign, um, which sounds a lot like the one that uh, was used in the Washington and, and, and the Harrison. My, w when I did this, my interest was, okay, so, so yes, they adopted, but how much was it used? And um, these are some outfitting uh, references uh, to ships of the Massachusetts Navy. And you can see they refer to pine trees here and there, but for the most part, they refer to continental ensigns, continental colors, things like that. Um, uh, which tends to say that they, they probably use the American flag, the continental flag, rather than a pine tree flag. Similarly, with operational references, American arms, the standard of the United States of America uh, struck to American arms, and the, the one for the protector actually refers to 13 stripes, which sounds like the, the American flag. Uh, similarly, with privateers, there are a couple of early references to pine trees, but uh, most of them are sound like uh, American flags, the one for the thorn down there, uh, 13 stars in his pennant. And the one that is sort of odd is the Cumberland. That was written long after the, um, the incident, and he's got everything in there. He's got a snake, he's got a, he's got a tree, he's got uh, the join or die motto. I think that was uh, that, that's sort of an outlier, and it's, it's questionable. 
So conclusions. Uh, the flag of the floating batteries was, uh, was created by the Army. It was not a pine tree. It was an elm tree, uh, primarily intended as a recognition symbol. It may have been used elsewhere by the Continental Army. Uh, the pine tree of Washington's cruisers was flown by two ships from Plymouth, possibly by some of the others, not officially adopted and not associated anyway with the Continental Navy, which it frequently is in, in flag books, <laughs> but uh, that's not correct. And the pine tree flag of the Massachusetts Navy, established by statute, but most uh, documents refer to the Continental or American flag. Um, just to quickly in, in, in closing, I may have to modify that third bullet. Uh, because our friend Dave Martucci has recently done some more research in outfitting records. He's found some references would look like a couple of them might be pine tree flags. So that we may have to revisit that conclusion. And that's it. Um, I thank you for indulging me. Any uh, questions for Peter? Yeah, I am um, Windsor for now. Um, I first saw the pine tree flag during the uh, attachment on the Capitol, and I was actually on watch at the time, and quickly did a cursory research study mm -hmm. for the flag, and uh, came across the pine tree riot incident hmm. in 1771, and that, in my very cursory research, that was like a possible uh, origin for that flag. I don't know if you just come across that incident as well as a possible origin for that no, but I, it wouldn't surprise me because, of course, trees have been associated with Massachusetts and New England since, since early colonial times. In fact, <laughs> um, let's see, one of my backup slides is um, various uh, depictions of the pine tree, you know, going back to the, uh, uh, to the 17th century. Um, well, I, an interesting point there is that their, their picture of a pine tree is quite different from what we see in on pine tree flags, like the one that they had at the Capitol. So are those the two different flags? Because the trees a little different when they have different one? Because, because as I was reading about the pine tree, right, it also had a very navy centric purpose in that the, the crown was the one the, the British were marking off America, uh, more mm -hmm. white pine right. sort of diameter used as ship's mass. Right, exactly, yeah. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, power. it's possible. You know, it, 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 it's hard to tell. <laughs> Any others? Uh, actually, we'll go uh, John person in over to the chat. Peter, are there other more coins like that? Like the chilling on the top? Is that, is that an outline? Is that are there, are, there other, are there other currency like that? Yes, yeah. Um, pine tree shillings were pretty common, and um, it, it also turns up on, on you know, notes and things like that. It, it seems to have been a fairly common symbol. Yeah, I think back to all the things that have been Yeah, what, what's interesting to me is the, is the depiction of three. The little cartoon I use was sort of a crude, <laughs> a crude uh, version of that. Um, but uh, and the one for John Paul Jones is interesting. You can just barely see it, but it looks kind of like almost like a, a menorah or something. It's got a, the, the, the trunk of the tree and the branches curving out like like this. Uh, yes, I actually have two for the chat. Uh, oh, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. That's a very interesting story. And he wonders if there's other flags of pine trees somewhere in the world. Um. There were a couple of other flags that had pine trees on them. Uh, one that's kind of famous is the Bucks of America flag, uh, which that's a whole other story. But, but uh, yes, it, it, it's a, a relatively common symbol. And uh, Scott Mainwaring also asks, why pine trees as opposed to some other kind? That's a good question. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, you know, something like the, 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 uh, the pine tree riot might have been might have uh, um, might have been the cause of that. Although I don't know, I don't know if that would account for pine trees. For example, on the pine tree shilling, that was long before uh, any events we're talking about. I guess possibly it was just a common New England tree, and it could be as simple as that. Actually, you have one here. Uh, quick question: When did it reemerge as a 
kind of insurrectionary, you know, modern insurrectionary flag. I mean, was that just this two years ago, or was it broken down before that? Uh, the, the question is, when when did you know? Since we saw one at the uh, at the insurrection at the Capitol, how how recently did it emerge as a symbol like that? I think it's fairly recent, and I think what happened is um, people who do things like that just latch on to anything. This is the Revolutionary War, you know, and and I guess the the appeal to heaven motto has some resonance in in their sort of ideological <laughs> view. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, because it's, it, it, it's if you think about it, it's sort of the same thing that that appeal to heaven originally came from. Hey, the government is 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 denying our rights, and we are appealing to heaven that we're right and we're trying to to overthrow them. Steve, what did you have? I was just about the people who are interested in the country question to refer to that film that came out in December, Morgan Harris. Mm -hmm. Morgan referred to a much older great article by David Mitchell. Uh, our, our members have invested <laughs> the country question and it's out there on the Yeah, the, 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 the point was that we already have several um, articles in our own Navajo literature about the antecedents of the pine tree, and uh, that's true. Um, yeah, Morgan, Morgan's article was a good one. I thought I saw one more. Uh, yes, I was just going to make a comment that. Looking symbolically, the, the pine tree being an evergreen would probably have some role there, especially if, um, with the original liberty tree being cut down, the fact that like, the leaves stay on year round would have some symbolic resonance. Yeah, interesting point. The the, the, uh, the comment was that uh, the fact that the pine tree uh, uh, you know, lives year round uh, could uh, make it an appropriate symbol. For, for liberty living forever, or something like that. Okay, thank you, Peter. Yeah.